In 1955, a drug called in the United States chlorpromazine, I think you called it Largactyl here in Denmark, it arrives in asylum medicine <clears throat> and it is said to kick off a great psychopharmacological revolution, a great advance in care. Our understanding is it was this drug that made it possible to empty the state, uh, you know, the, the mental hospitals. We remember this drug as the first antipsychotic, and if you hear those words antipsychotic, as it's, it's, it's almost like as if it's an antibiotic, a specific antidote to psychosis. Then we get antidepressants, we get anti-anxiety agents, again, each time anti-something or other, as if they're specific antidotes. And then if we go forward in this story of progress, in 1987, we get Prozac. It's the first of the second generation uh, psychiatric drugs, which are said to be safer and more effective than the first. So this is this rise up this medical ladder of progress. Then we get new atypical antipsychotics. And again, and, and so for example, in 1998, the U.S. Surgeon General in the United States uh, named David Satcher. So this is our top doctor in the United States. He, he issued like a 500-page report on mental health, and here's what he said. Prior to the arrival of corpromazine in asylum medicine, we lacked treatments that would prevent people from becoming chronically ill. People used to just stay in the, in the mental hospitals. Now we have a vast array of safe and effective treatments for well-defined disorders that help people live more normal lives, function well. So that's the story of progress, okay? And certainly it's the story of progress that when I was a newspaper writer writing about psychiatric issues, I believed in. And at least in the United States, we used to hear this metaphor. The drugs were like insulin for diabetes. Did you ever hear that in, in, in Denmark? Well, if that's so, there are few, that's a story of extraordinary progress. Because that's a story where you've uncovered the pathology of a disorder, and now you have a drug that fixes that pathology. And if you look in the history of medicine, of great advances, that's a model for a great advance in medical care. And insulin for diabetes is a perfect example of a great advance in medical care, right? You identify the pathology, and now you have a remedy for that. So that's the context, and I think it's that story actually in, in large measure that drives our use of these medications. And in the last 20 years, there's been a worldwide surge in the use of the medications led by the United States. In 1987, when Prozac came to market, we spent about $800 million on psychiatric drugs. And by 2010, anybody guess, have a guess about what we were spending in the United States on psychiatric drugs? Any, any guess? 40 billion, so a 50-fold increase. And one of the things in the United States we kept hearing is that these disorders are under-recognized and under-treated, so many more people are getting treatment, so hopefully as more people are getting treatment, that theoretically if these drugs are so effective, we should hopefully see the burden of mental illness in our society go down. Does that make sense? But that's sort of the expectation. And that's really the story I, I tell in Anatomy of an Epidemic. There's this common story, but is, is science telling us a different story, a more complex story? Because in the United States, you take one glance around and the burden of mental illness is not decreasing. It's, it's rising dramatically, so that's the beginning point of saying what's going on. So one of the first things I wanted to do was just trace the discovery of these medications. How did it come about? Now, often when you think about great advances in medical care, you start with looking at the people with, quote, the disease, you identify the pathology, and then after that identification has happened, you develop a drug. That's not how psychiatric medications came about. Psychiatric medications actually came about by research looking for magic bullets, basically, for infectious illnesses. And what's a magic bullet? A magic bullet in, in medical literature is, 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 a, is a, a drug that will be a toxin to like a bacteria. It will kill that bacteria without interacting with tissues of the, the human body. And that's what makes it a magic bullet. It's just toxic to the invader, and, but not to the individual. And penicillin obviously is an example of a magic bullet. So start with antipsychotics. Where did they arise from? 
Well, they actually arose, if you go far enough back, into research for magic bullets against worm-borne illnesses. So they were running through different compounds to see if they could find something that would kill worm-borne illnesses without causing great damage to the body. And as they're doing this, they found a group of compounds that maybe seem to have some um, merit in that regard. But as they tested those compounds, as they used them, they noticed a couple things, that they had a side effect in humans that might seem useful initially in surgery. And actually what the first compound did is, uh, there was a problem with surgery with uh, surgical shock when you cut someone open, and this new drug had antihistaminergic uh, properties, so basically prevented this, this uh, response of the, this body to this wound in essence. So they now begin developing this, it's French uh, uh, surgeons begin developing this, and as they use it in surgery, they also begin to notice this. It induces a great emotional sort of tranquility, or people can't make an emotional response to the world. They talk about their, their patients being separated the, from the world as if by a glass wall. So what they realize is this compound seems to um, prevent sort of an emotional response to the world. And one of the things they notice, but they, it does it even while not making a person, uh, you know, so sedated they lose consciousness. So you could retain consciousness, but not mount a, much of an emotional response to the world. So the surgeons notice this. At some point they present at a conference, and psychiatrists say, oh, this is very much like a, a surgical lobotomy. It's causing a change in being, very much akin to what we see when we do a, an operation where we, in essence, sever the frontal lobes. Now, today we might think that's an odd thing to compare it to a surgical lobotomy because today we remember <coughs> surgical lobotomy as a mutilating surgery, but it wasn't in 1955. In 1949, the inventor of a surgical lobotomy, a Portuguese neurologist named Igaz Moniz, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for having invented surgical lobotomy. So it was seen as a miracle brain surgery. And what surgical lobotomy did is it did cause with great regularity a change in being where someone was less engaged and that was seen as a good thing. That was the value. And these drugs were seen as the new ones, the tranquil uh, chlorpromazine and all, were seen as causing a change in being similar to what surgical lobotomy did. And now if you go into the science of it, there's a reason for this. So, so uh, frontal lobotomy, of course, is this is the frontal lobes, is that, that front part of our brain. So if you look at how chlorpromazine or largactyl works, it basically blocks uh, the passage of messages along what are called dopaminergic pathways. And one of the dopaminergic pathways goes to the frontal lobes. So in essence, you are diminishing activity in the same part of the brain that um, surgical lobotomy did. So you can see the kinship. Anyway, when those drugs first came out, they were likened to chemical lobotomy. So I'm talking about the first, you know, chlorpromazine. They were also called major tranquilizers. And does that, does that word translate well, tranquilizers? It, it's not, it wasn't seen as an antipsychotic. And we'll get in a, in a little bit to how they start being seen as antipsychotic. But that's where antipsychotics came from out of research into surgery, uh, the drugs that they saw prevented a normal sort of emotional response to the world. And because of that, they saw that it would be helpful in asylum medicine. So that's the historical context for that. The next group of drugs we get are actually the anti-anxiety agents we now remember as anti-anxiety agents. And they arose from um, research into gram-negative bacteria. So you have gram-positive bacteria and penicillin and other antibiotics are very effective against gram-positive bacteria, but there's another very common type of bacteria called gram-negative that penicillin is not effective for. So they were looking for magic bullets against this other type of bacteria. And they began using, uh, uh, you know, testing different medications, and they came upon a group uh, initially this is actually for something called Meprobate, that when they gave it to rats, they found that rats just didn't care. What that I mean is, is 
Normally, if you put a rat, for example, on an electrified floor, they'll become very aggressive. These rats didn't care. And once again, they didn't sort of amount any sort of emotional response to the world. They became much less aggressive. And this begins research into agents that, let it, that eventually become the anti-anxiety agents. Because think about this. The rats aren't care, they're, they're not getting anxious, their heartbeat is not increasing in times of peril, which is a sign of your usual emotional response. So they're saying, see, if you have people who are too anxious, they, they mount too much of an emotional response to the world, we can um, uh, now have an agent that dims that response. And one of my favorite advertisements is when you see these drugs, and they're called the happy pills, when they're introduced in the United States. One of my favorite advertisements goes like this, or one of my favorite stories about these drugs. The scientists talk about this. <clears throat> if you see a car coming, about to hit you, you may still try to run, but you, 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 won't, get, uh, you, you won't be afraid anymore, something to that effect. <laughs> and the point is, you just won't mount your usual emotional response. And, at the same time, they were called happy pills, that sometimes they were also called don't give a damn pills. Okay, so that was the, the two things. Now, the antidepressants came out of research into anti-tuberculosis drugs. The agents they're using are actually agents that were fuels in, sort of synthesized by Nazis German scientists during World War II as a type of fuel when their regular fuels ran out. So they, they, they get these type of fuels, and after the war, the Allies say, well, let's see if any of these novel compounds have, uh, you know, magic bullet properties. They find a couple that seem to be maybe effective against tuberculosis. They give them to TB patients. And they note, at least this is how Time Magazine reported it, that the TB patients, and think about TB, you have you know, lung problems, you're very lethargic. Supposedly the TB patients became roused. So they said, see, this is a drug that causes arousal, so maybe we can lift depressed patients, okay? The point of this story is this. All these agents were not discovered, this first generation, out of an understanding of what was going on in the brains of people with schizophrenia, depression, or anxiety. They were all brought into psychiatry because they had, in essence, adverse effects that were seen as helpful for psychiatric patients. So the antipsychotics basically quieted person, tranquilized them, made them less responsive. The anti-anxiety agents, very similar. And the antidepressants seem to be arousal agents, but they're brought into psychiatry because of these adverse effects. This now is going to get transformed into the chemical imbalance theory of mental disorders. So how do we move from adverse effects into this theory? Because now once we get to a chemical imbalance theory, that means they are fixing a pathology. And the, the, this story arises in this way. What happens in the 1960s is they start to understand how the drugs act on the brain, okay? It's not, we're, we're not gonna get into the pathology of people yet, but it's how the drugs act on the brain. So how do neurons communicate in the brain? And by the way, this was just being learned in the 60s, okay? It's not like we knew this before. So you have one neuron, which we call the presynaptic neuron. This is how neurons communicate in the brain. That presynaptic neuron was found to re release a small molecule, which we call a neurotransmitter or a chemical messenger, and that molecule binds with receptors on the second neuron, and we say it fits into those receptors like a key into a lock. Do you use that metaphor here as well? And when that happens, when <coughs> neuron number one releases a chemical which binds with receptors on the second neuron, that's the way a message is passed. And when that message is passed, one of two things will happen. It can excite the second neuron, cause it to fire, or there are also ones that are inhibitory, make it harder to fire, okay? One final thing, sorry. Let's go back to how neurons communicate. You have a presynaptic neuron, releases that messenger, say dopamine, into that tiny gap. It binds with receptors. Now the brain has to have a way to, to, to curb that message, okay? To end that message. 
So it has to remove that chemical, that dopamine, from that tiny gap, okay? It has to remove it. And it removes it in one of two ways. It either goes back up into the presynaptic neuron via reuptake channels, or an enzyme comes along, metabolizes as it breaks down the dopamine into metabolites, and those metabolites are carted off as waste. Okay, does that make sense? So what does, what do the first generation antipsychotics do? Chlorpromazine, Haldol, what do you call Haldol? Okay, so there's a group of these first generation, uh, and they're called, they're actually initially named neuroleptics. Does, does that word, a neuroleptic is something that takes hold of the nervous system. That's actually their first name. So what they found is, eventually, is that these drugs block 70% of, of the receptors for dopamine, and actually a very particular type of the receptor called the D2 receptor. So at a therapeutic dose, what's happening is this. That molecule, the drug, is fitting into the receptor on the postsynaptic neuron, but it's, it's blocking it. It's like pouring glue into the lock, all right? It's not activating it, it's just blocking it. And so since it's on there, now the, now the uh, neurotransmitter has no, no lock to go to, okay? So because it's blocking it, okay, researchers hypothesized maybe people are, are at, with schizophrenia have too much dopamine, okay? So that's where that arises. Understanding of the drug, and then we're gonna, pos we're gonna posit that the opposite is the cause of schizophrenia, okay? Now how about antidepressants? Antidepressants were similar. The first type of antidepressants, uh, one were tricyclic antidepressants, the other were known as monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And they both kept a serotonin, a different chemical messenger, in that synaptic cleft longer than normal, although by different means. So what did tricyclics do? Tricyclics prevented the reuptake of serotonin from that synaptic cleft, and so serotonin now stays longer in that gap. It's upping serotonergic activity. A drug we call a monoamine oxidase inhibitor what it does is it inhibits the enzyme that breaks down serotonin, and because of that, once again, serotonin stays longer in the synaptic cleft. So researchers hypothesized again um, antidepressants, uh, and depression is due to low, depression, low serotonin, which is then uh, you know, fixed by these drugs that increase it. So these things get... There's a little bit of other evidence, but this is the basic evidence for the chemical imbalance theory of, of mental disorders. They arise in the late 60s. Now, in the 1970s, we're gonna begin to investigate them. How are we gonna investigate them? Well, researchers actually came out initially with a very sort of novel way to try to see about uh, the levels of, of, of these neurotransmitters in the brain, and here's what they said. Let's start with this uh, a high dopamine theory of depression, uh, the schizophrenia. An enzyme comes along, metabolizes the dopamine, right? Those metabolites are carted off as waste, and they're gonna show up in the cerebrospinal fluid. So researchers said this, if people with schizophrenia have too much dopamine activity, they should have extra high levels of dopamine metabolites in their cerebrospinal fluid. Does that make sense? It's an indirect measure of it. So you go back to the, like the mid, so they do this, uh, it's like late 70s, and the researchers announce, we have found the cause of schizophrenia. In fact, schizophrenia patients have too much, too many dopamine metabolites in their cerebral spinal fluid. New York Times reports, looks like this cause of schizophrenia has been found. But then you have to read the paper. Because the researchers said, we don't know if this is due to the disease or the drug. Is it a response to the drug? And so now, next what they do is they do it in unmedicated patients, patients who have never been medicated. And once they do that, they do not find that the metabolite levels are abnormally high in schizophrenia patients. So what are they seeing? They're seeing, in essence, this. Well, this is the second part, but we'll get to this in a second. So, the brain, being this extraordinarily neuroplastic organ, has all these feedback mechanisms. You go on a drug, 
an antipsychotic. It blocks dopamine, right? It's acting as a break. So what is your brain going to do to try to maintain normal functioning? It's going to put down the accelerator, right? And researchers say today it's trying to maintain a homeostatic equilibrium. Okay? It's trying to maintain normal functioning. So you go on an antipsychotic, acts as a break, the presynaptic neurons, at least for a period of time, now put out more dopamine than normal. And because they're putting out more dopamine than normal, now more is getting metabolized, and that's why for a period you will show elevated levels of metabolites in your cerebral spinal fluid. Okay? Now the second thing is that once researchers came to understand that, they said this. Maybe the problem isn't with the presynaptic release of dopamine. Maybe it's that there's too many dopamine receptors and that the brain is extra sensitive to dopamine. So at autopsy, they find a way, and I don't know how this is done, but they have a way to, to label the density of dopamine receptors. And they found at autopsy, people with schizophrenia have 50%, 70%, too many dopamine receptors. So researchers say again, and this article appeared in Nature, a very prestigious journal, we have found the cause of schizophrenia. It's too many dopamine receptors. All right? But once again, the researchers said, we don't know if it's due to the drug or the disease. And what they eventually managed to learn to do in the 1980s, particularly in Europe, this, some of this research was done, was actually labeled living patients, okay? And what they found is that prior to going on medication, they were not seeing abnormally high levels of um, dopamine receptors. But once you were on the drug, they did. And it was somewhere between 30% and 100% more receptors than normal. And you can read a paper, I think it's 1986, that says, our research shows this increase in dopamine receptors is entirely iatrogenic, meaning entirely drug-caused. And now this is a, uh, a, an illustration that I took from a medical textbook without paying any copyright. <laughs> anyway, the point of this is this, is this is now used as an illustration of how the drug responds to an antipsychotic. So what are you seeing here? You're seeing that the drug is blocked, you see those little white circles in the receptors? That's like the drug is blocking the receptors. And now, in order to try to maintain normal function, those postsynaptic receptors are increasing their density, their number. You see that? And this is often called now upregulation of receptors, okay? But I hope, I hope you see the mechanism here. Now, do you see a little bit of irony in this by any chance? because schizophrenia was, was hypothesized to be due to too much dopamine. And by the way, one of the reasons, there was one other bit of uh, information for that hypothesis, and that came from amphetamines. So amphetamines released dopamine, and it was well known that amphetamines could cause psychosis, induce psychosis, so that was another fact. But the irony here is this. They didn't find that as a matter of course, people with schizophrenia or psychotic disorders have too much dopamine activity in the brain. But after going on the drug, you have the very problem or the abnormality hypothesized to cause the disorder in the first place. Now, of these two compensatory mechanisms, it seems like the extra release of dopamine burns out after a while, it doesn't stay. But these extra receptors do, do stay, and you'll see them at autopsy, okay? So let's go to the other main theory of chemical imbalances, the, uh, the low serotonin theory of depression. Okay, so what do those two classes of drugs do? They keep serotonin and norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft longer than normal, right? So they hypothesize that oh, um, people with depression have low serotonin, and basically, they do the same sort of research, okay? They look to see if the metabolite levels are different in depressed patients versus non-depressed patients, and they don't find that to be so. And then they did something really interesting in, in, in the U.S. in 1984. So they found that, as a matter of course, there wasn't this, this uh, low serotonin, as measured by metabolites, in depressed patients. But they did know 
that certain patients seem to respond better to antidepressants than others. It wasn't universal. So the NIMH in the early 1980s said this, maybe it's those people with low levels of, of metabolites in their cerebral spinal fluid on this bell curve of, of metabolite levels who are the best responders to antidepressants. So we're going to have a subgroup of depressed patients that do have low serotonin and the drugs are going to fix that. So they ran a study in the early 1980s to test that hypothesis and here's what they found. Yep, those metabolite levels fell along a bell curve. Some had lower, some had higher. But there was no correlation between metabolite levels and response to the drug. Those with high metabolite levels were just as likely to uh, respond to the drug as those with low metabolite levels. So look what they conclude in 1984. You see this? I'll just let you read that. What you see here is the, the low serotonin theory of depression dying in 1984. Okay? Long time ago. So how does it get reborn? It gets reborn in 1987 when Eli Lilly brings Prozac to market and especially in the United States where we have um, directed consumer marketing, it really became a marketing story. Fix it, you know, it's like insulin for diabetes. It was a way as a metaphor for helping people understand, really to help sell the drug. Now, what's amazing to me is it just shows the power of American psychiatry and the power in essence of the drug companies in the United States to export that story because it got exported basically worldwide at one point. But you see it's dying here. How about the next, next point here? Stephen Stahl is a person who believes in molecular psychiatry, so he's very much biologically oriented. So in 2000, he writes a book called Essential Psychopharmacology. It's a textbook used in psychiatry. And he says, there is no clear and convincing evidence that uh, serotonin is a monoamine, okay? Monoamine deficiency accounts for depression. That is, there is no real monoamine deficit, all right? Now, the dopamine theory of schizophrenia, researchers are still researching this, actually. Is, is there something wrong with the dopamine system in certain subsets of people? There was a recent Swedish article saying, you know, maybe in this subset you see some problem, et cetera. But the classic hyperactive uh, dopamine theory of schizophrenia fell by the wayside in the early 90s. They said it's no longer credible. And this person here, Stephen Hyman, he's the former director of the NIMH. So at one point he's our top psychiatrist. He's also a neuroscientist. You'll see what he wrote in 2002. There just is no compelling evidence that a lesion, uh, you understand a lesion in, in, in English, it means like a pathology in the dopamine system is a primary cause of schizophrenia. Next here is this, Kenneth Kendler. Who is Kenneth Kendler? Kenneth Kendler was recognized as one of the world's foremost experts on chemical imbalance theories of mental disorders. So in 2005, you'll see he wrote a paper about this, and what does he say? You can read it. He's saying, we looked for these chemical imbalances, but we did not find them. And in America, it's interesting, sometimes I do, <laughs> you're gonna have to forgive me on this, but we export things sometimes, <laughs> and then sometimes it seems like, sometimes in Europe, things fall apart faster in the United States. Well, I'm still hearing about chemical imbalance things in, in like Sweden, places like that. In the US, it's completely fallen apart. It's, uh, people are saying it's just wrong. I'm talking about the biological people. And here's my favorite quote of this. Ronald Pies is a former editor of the Psychiatric Times, which is the newsletter of the American Psychiatric Association. So here's what he wrote. You can see. It's always a kind of urban legend, never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. In fact, if you read this whole letter, he says basically, blame Bob Whitaker for the chemical imbalance theory. In other words, he, he says, it was used by critics of psychiatry as a way to discredit psychiatry. Psychiatry knew it was false long, long time ago, but we pretend, critics pretend that psychiatry says this as a way to discredit psychiatry.
Now, a couple years ago, I gave a grand rounds at Massachusetts General Hospital, which is a Harvard-affiliated hospital. It's the number one psychiatry-rated department in the United States. And the chemical imbalance, it was sort of a debate. And the chemical imbalance story came out, and a person named Andrew Nirenberg said this. That model was outdated in 1985, or 25 years ago. And he says, and yet you make it sound, with this sort of, <laughs> this sort of sneering thing, you make it sound like we still believe in this. So I said to him and all the residents, I said, you know, you're right. It was outdated 25 years ago, but I'm pretty sure you forgot to tell the American public. And everyone went like this. Because in the United States, 80% of Americans now know that low serotonin causes depression. And think about how powerful this metaphor is. The metaphor says, A, it's correcting something, B, it tells you you have a broken brain, and C, it tells you you have to take the drug forever, right? So it's really a powerful uh, uh, metaphor. I, I will tell you, in 1999, I was writing a series for the Boston Globe on abuses of psychiatric patients in research settings. At that time, I completely believed this story, that they fix chemical imbalances, and one of the things we wrote about were studies in which they had withdrawn psychiatric medications from, uh, antipsychotic medications from schizophrenia patients. And we said those studies are unethical because you would never withdraw insulin from a diabetic, right? So why would you withdraw uh, antipsychotic anti from a schizophrenia patient? That was the context, okay? By the way, I was very much rewarded for that series which fit within this context of progress. But one of the things that started me on the pathway, the intellectual pathway that led me to here today was this. I asked someone named Jeffrey Lieberman, who's the outgoing president of the American Psychiatric Association. I'd gotten on the phone, he says, yeah, these drugs are like insulin for diabetes, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, that's great. Can you just point me to the studies that found this to be so? I just wanna read those studies, just do a little homework. And he said, well, we don't have those studies. So what do you mean you don't have these studies? This is, I've been writing this for 10 years. And he said, well, it's just a metaphor. I said, what do you mean it's a metaphor? I didn't think I was writing metaphors. He says, it's a metaphor, and there's a little, you'll see this. It gets, it gets people to understand why they should take the drugs. Otherwise, they don't understand it. Seriously, that's what it was said. Because schizo quote, people with schizophrenia lack insight, they won't know why to take the drugs. So literally it was explained to me as a metaphor for why, in order to communicate with the public why they should take the drugs. But the minute I asked to see the data, I was told they didn't have it, which really shocked me actually. Because I honestly did not know I was writing a metaphor. So then I called up the maker of Risperdal. Do you call it Risperdal? Yeah. Okay. Because actually I couldn't quite believe this. So I, 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 because now Risperdal was a newer drug and they're said to fix like five different neurotransmitters in the brain. I got the same thing. These are like insulin for diabetes. And I said, well, can you show me the, <laughs> can you show me the studies? And the researcher from Janssen said, it's just a metaphor. <laughs> Anyway, that's, that's the story of chemical imbalances. So I think you see a couple things here. A, we didn't find it. B, the drugs induced the very changes hypothesized to cause the problems in the first place. And as we go through the long-term outcomes literature today, this is often also called oppositional tolerance. We're gonna see if that worry pops up, okay? When they actually go over the long-term outcomes literature. But finally, let's just look at this paper by Stephen Hyman in 1996. You might wanna see it just to assure yourself that what I'm talking about here is, a, is a, an accepted scientific understanding. Because he was director of the NIMH when he wrote this paper called The Paradigm for uh, Understanding Psychotropic Drugs. You'll see the first part. They create perturbations in neurotransmitter function by say blocking Receptors are blocking the reuptake process. That's the perturbation. Then he says the brain tries to adapt 
to that perturbation in order to maintain normal functioning, okay? And it's always going to be the opposite. If the drug puts down the brake, the brain's going to try to put down the accelerator or vice versa, okay? Now you see this causes substantial and long-lasting alterations in neural function, okay? What's he really talking about here? He's talking about if you get changes in the density of receptors for, say, serotonin or dopamine, that means you're getting a change in gene expression. So you're even getting how genes are expressed. That's pretty profound. And then you'll see this. After a few weeks, the brain is now operating in a manner that is both qualitatively as well as quantitatively different from the normal state. So, again, we have a common understanding that these, were, these are normalizing agents, but in truth, they're abnormalizing agents. You can just see here, this is just the paradox I've been talking about here. A couple things here, though. That data does not tell us how medications are going to affect people long term. We're not going to have to go into that. But once you have this conception, I think you can see a couple things. So go on an antipsychotic, puts down the brake. Your, your brain puts down the accelerator. You see why coming off might be really problematic? Because your brain is adapted to the drug. So a lot of what you may see when people come off a medication is in fact the fact that it's, it's adapted to the presence, and now once you remove it, you're going to get withdrawal symptoms, et cetera, okay? The second conception, though, is this. So now we go on a drug, let's say an antidepressant that uh, increases serotonergic activity. Your brain now uh, goes into a sub-serotonergic state, puts down the brake. You see why this might lead to less than optimal functioning of serotonergic systems compared to, in essence, the brain given to us by evolution? You can see why this could be problematic. So that's one of the things when we go to long-term outcomes. It's just a different conception. Okay, the next step in this that I did in this book. So in, in Anatomy of an Epidemic, one thing I tried to do was understand how were the drugs discovered, what did science tell us, how did they investigate the chemical imbalance, and how do they affect the brain, okay? Just that very sort of scientific piece as a context now for looking at what science tells us about how they affect lives in the long term. And as a first step on this, as I looked at this, during this era of the psychopharmacological revolution, has the burden of mental illness in American society, as measured by the people on disability, unable to care for themselves, gone down or gone up, whatever. I'm just gonna look at the disability numbers. So, in 1955, uh, we had no social services program, so people who couldn't care for themselves were in state and county hospitals. Now, there were 550,000 such people in state and county hospitals in the United States in 1955, but you need to dig into that data a bit because these hospitals were also operating a bit as nursing homes. So people with end-stage dementia, syphilis-related dementia were in these nursing uh, mental hospitals. There were 350,000 people with a psychiatric diagnosis, schizophrenia, and manic depressive illness. You look at the population at that time, so you take 350,000, look at the population, and that's a disability rate of 213 per 100,000, okay? Now, we deinstitutionalize in the next 20 years, just like you deinstitutionalize, and we set up a program to take care of people in the community. They can get social service. We have two different types. We have SSSI, which is for people who've never worked, and then we have a program called SSDI for people who've worked and then become disabled. And what other researchers have said, if you want to track the number of disabled mentally ill in the United States forward, after deinstitutionalization, you have to look at the number of people on government support and declared eligible because of mental illness, okay? Now, there may be people with back problems who are mentally ill. We're not going to count them. This is just the people who said the disability was mental illness. You'll see that by 1987, we had 1.25 million people on disability. So during this era of the first generation drugs, we went from 350,000 to about 1.25 million in a higher rate. But obviously, what's the caveat here? Maybe you had to be much sicker to be in the hospital in 55 than to be on disability in 1987. Fortunately, from then, we have the same metric, just people on disability. 
all right? And it's also, why 1987? Two reasons. The institutionalization is complete. This is when we first, when Prozac gets introduced. This is when we really embrace the use of psychiatric medications, and you'll see what's happened. It's basically, now we're around five million people on disability. So over the past, whatever that is, 23 years, you'll see there's like a tripling in the uh, disability rate. Now again, I will say this does not prove anything about the merits of the medications, but I think it raises a question about why as we use the drugs more and more, are we seeing higher disability rates? Now, this is just the Prozac area, you'll see. Now one of the things that happened after I wrote uh, Anatomy of an Epidemic, people said, it's only happening in the United States, and the reason it's happening in the United States is because we have such a Darwinian culture. You know, we don't have national health service, that sort of thing. We've been cutting back welfare, so people are going on disability to get access to health care. All right, that was one of the thoughts. It's just a social phenomenon. It's not any sign of an increased burden of mental illness. So since then, uh, you know, the book has been translated in other, you know, it's being read in other countries, so I started getting disability data from other countries. Now this is New Zealand. As you know, New Zealand has a very good social net service support, and you'll see, it's about a fourfold increase in the past 20 years. Here's Australia. Same thing, fourfold increase. Now this is data of a very, little different sort, but it's actually very revealing. So what you see here is the number of people going on uh, to disability in Iceland, it's about the same, and then suddenly it jumps up, right? And you're getting about a 250% increase over the last decade. Well, Iceland being a small market was slower to adapt to, uh, to, to begin to use SSRIs. And really, it's around here that SSRI consumption really goes up in around the mid-1990s in Iceland. And the reason this may be revealing is what's driving all this increase in disability is not psychotic disorders. It's depression and bipolar disorder. That's really what's driving this increase in disorders. And so the, maybe by the end of the day we'll see is there a reason that increased SSRI use might be stirring something like this. This is uh, data thanks to Olga got me this data. It's just looking about the number of people going on disability each year. You'll see, and it's roughly tripled between 1999 and 2010. Now, I don't know about all your social policies in Denmark, but I, hasn't there even been some resistance to trying to make it harder to go on disability here in Denmark? So you'll see, even in spite of that change, you're seeing this rise. Now, here's Sweden. And this is, again, the percentage of people going on to mental illness. And the point is, the Scandinavian countries obviously have very good social support systems. You have some sort of national health service. So you're seeing it in these other countries. But the Scandinavian countries are pretty big. You, I don't know so much about Denmark, but Sweden uses a lot of antidepressants. I think you do as well. Anyway, you'll see that there's sort of a, uh, it's universal. You see it in, in developed country after developed country that's really embraced this paradigm of care. I mean, these are dramatic swings upward in sort of the burden of disability. So, given that question, now the next step I went to do in this book is, okay, well, let's try to figure out how do medications shape lives over the long term? And one of the reasons I think this book has um, gotten some attention uh, in other, you know, in various countries, and I will tell you it often provokes a very hostile response in certain <laughs> segments. It's really the first book to look at long-term outcomes as opposed to the short-term effects of drugs. So how do we assess the efficacy of drugs? And starting with the FDA, uh, we'll do short-term trials, right, like six-week trials, and if they knock down a, the symptom of the, a, a, the target symptom of disorder better than placebo, we say we're, it's effective, okay? And they get on the market. But what I want to see here is how does it affect people's ability to function over the course of two years, five years, ten years? Which is a very different question than the short-term efficacy of the drug. So I'm a journalist, right? So the first thing I have to do uh, is, is find out what is the evidence base for the use of antipsychotics.
And by the way, in, in the early 1990s, I had a period uh, as director of publications at uh, Harvard Medical School. And at that time, it was, it, there was a great emphasis on what was called evidence-based medicine. And so what is evidence-based medicine? Why do we need evidence-based medicine? The idea is, frankly, that it's quite possible for doctors to become deluded about their merits of their therapies. That's sort of what history of medicine tells us. And that supposedly science, these, if we can find a body of evidence, will help us know that what we're doing is helpful, okay? That's the idea behind it. It's not just clinical perception. Okay, antipsychotics. You go back to the 1960s. People come into an emergency room. They're either put on placebo, they're put on drug, and after six weeks, the drug-treated patients have a greater reduction of psychotic symptoms than the placebo patients, okay? So the drugs are seen as effective. They knock down the symptoms of psychosis better than placebo over the short term, and that's why the drugs get approved by... Um, the FDA and other regulatory authorities. And I'm not challenging this, okay? But I will tell you that the evidence for this is much less robust than you think. It's 50 years later, and there was someone was doing, John Bola was doing a review for the Cochrane, the Cochrane Review, and what he wanted to see was he wanted to find studies where they were just first episode studies. In other words, the people coming into the study hadn't been previously exposed to drug. And believe it or not, 50 years later, he could only find something like six studies with a total of 500 patients. I'm talking about internationally. And he said in those six studies, there really wasn't evidence of short-term efficacy. Now, in those six studies, they were always doing some sort of experimental form of care. This is not just placebo, it was psychosocial. There were other attempts to sort of limit those symptoms. Anyway, I'm just telling you, in mainstream psychiatry, the short-term efficacy is seen as absolutely well-established. I'm not trying to challenge it, it's, it's pointless. That's seen as well-established, okay? But I'm just telling you, if you actually dig into the evidence, it's, it's not as robust as, as you might think. Then the next part is, let's go to the 1960s. You have people on these medications. You're a doctor. What's your next question? How long should I keep them on, right? So they ran studies designed like this. They would take those people who were good responders, that subset of patients who were good responders to antipsychotics, and they had to be a subset because we needed to do these next studies in people whose symptoms were under control, okay? So, and, and maybe it's about 40% of people initially treated with antipsychotics who still have symptoms under control a year later. So we take that group under control, half are abruptly withdrawn from the drug, half are maintained on the drug, and with great regularity, those ab ab abruptly withdrawn from the drug relapsed at a higher rate. They were re-hospitalized, their psychotic symptoms returned. So doctors said, see, you take away the drug and the disease returns. You see that? And now that becomes your evidence for long-term use. They lower the risk of relapse, okay? Now actually I think there's a third part of the evidence base in some ways that is the most powerful part. Imagine you're a doctor. Person comes into your emergency room, clinic, whatever, you give them the drug, you see some change, some abatement of symptoms, you see the drug works. Then that person goes home and says, I hate these drugs, throws the drugs away, and they come back to your hospital. They relapse, right? So your clinical perception tells you these medications are necessary over the long term. That's your clinical perception. Okay, does that make sense? So that's the first part of the evidence base. Then are there any limitations with that uh, long term, uh, with that evidence base? Well, you'll see there's basically three limitations. The first is, do the relapse studies tell you anything about how people are functioning over the long term? Whether they're working, socializing, enjoying life? All the relapse studies tell you is, once on the medication, don't go off abruptly. Really bad idea, okay? Because you're gonna be at real high risk of relapse. But they don't tell us how people are functioning. The second thing is, you can see that there's a design flaw with the relapse studies, with the withdrawal studies. Virtually all of them are abrupt withdrawal, 
And, in, uh, and we now know that abrupt withdrawal increases the risk of relapse. And in fact, in 1996, a researcher named Patricia Gilbert from University of California, I think LA or San Diego, summarized all the relapse literature and she said something like this. The relapse rate for the drug withdrawn patients is 66%, something like that. And for those maintained, it's only 16% in the next like six months. But then a well-known researcher named Ross Balda Serini from Harvard Medical School said, but wait a minute, these are virtually all abrupt withdrawal studies. What's the rate of relapse if you gradually withdraw the drug? And by the way, there basically weren't any studies designed to see if you could get people off successfully. But what he did find were studies, some studies where the drug had been like withdrawn like in three weeks rather than just cut off, or studies where people had been on an injectable and so the idea is the drug left more slowly. And in those studies, the relapse rate was only one third as high as in the abrupt withdrawal studies. So the point is this is, the relapse studies tell us don't come off the drug abruptly, but there is a design flaw in terms of telling us what is the natural risk of relapse if you're not on the medication, okay? Now the third thing is this. Do physicians have any experience with the natural course of psychotic disorders today? They don't see it, right? So they have no sense of how schizo quote, schizophrenia may played out over a long period of time or other psychotic disorders. It's missing that foil. So once we understand that there's limitations with the evidence base, the next step for me as a journalist is to say, okay, are there other types of studies out there that show that antipsychotics improve long-term outcomes, okay? Now the literature is vast, so what do I do as a journalist? I try to see if other researchers can point me to such studies. And in 2002, Emmanuel Stipp went through the literature He's a pretty well-known psychiatrist from uh, the University of Montreal, and he wrote this for European Psychiatry. After 50 years of neuroleptics, of antipsychotics, are we able to answer the following simple question? Are these drugs effective in treating uh, schizophrenia? There is no compelling evidence on the matter when long-term is considered. So you see why this is important to me? So this is a researcher who says he went out to see if he could find the evidence that shows the drugs are improving long-term outcomes, and he says he can't find it. Now, one of the things, you, if you read reviews of anatomy, and there's plenty of hostile reviews out there, they'll say, I cherry-picked my data. In other words, there's plenty of studies out there that show the drugs are improving long-term outcomes. That criticism has been raised again and again and again, but here's what's never happened. They've never pointed me to study I've missed. So if I really had cherry-picked my data, they would be able to say, here's these other studies. And my point here is, for, since we have time today, you see the process I'm trying to do here? Can they point to other studies? And they're saying they can't. And then the next thing is this. If we wish to base psychiatry and evidence-based medicine, we run a genuine risk in taking a close look at what has long been considered fact. In other words, what he's saying is we may be surprised by what we find if we now really go through the long-term outcomes literature. And for me, this was like a green light. Okay, this is legitimate inquiry to ask how the drugs affect the long-term course of psychotic disorders. Maybe it's going to be surprising, but here's a mainstream researcher saying, this is legitimate, okay? We really need to see what science is telling us. Before we get into this, one of the things to answer this question about how medications shape long-term outcomes is you need to have some sense of, of what is the natural course of a disorder. And schizophrenia is such a, it's a concept that has changed so much that that information is, you can find different ideas about what the natural course of schizophrenia is. But from 1945 to 1955, this is the decade before antipsychotics are introduced into asylum medicine, the NIMH, that's the National Institute of Mental Health, which is our lead agency for uh, researching psychiatric disorders, conducted a couple of longer term studies of first episode schizophrenia patients, hospitalized to two hospitalized, like in 1947 and 1948. 
Now, what we remember today is that people diagnosed with schizophrenia didn't get out of the hospitals, right? They had schizophrenia. It was the drugs that made it possible for them to live outside the hospital. That's false. What you see from 1945 to 55 is that by 12 to 18 months, 65 to 75 percent of the patients would be discharged of first episode patients. And then if you go back five years later, about 65 percent would still be out in the community, living and, and basically working, living independently. Now think about this, 100 people come into a hospital, 67 leave, but 33 don't. The next year, another 100 come in, 67 leave, 33 stay. You do build up a chronic population, you see that? So what the doctors start seeing is the chronic population, that backwards population, and they tend to forget this first episode group that is getting better and doing okay five years later. And in England, where they were diagnosing schizophrenia more narrowly at this time, U.S. did have a, a broader uh, spectrum of you know, looser diagnostic, diagnostic criteria. They did a five-year study at the same time as well. And what did they report? At the end of five years, one-third of their schizophrenia patients simply weren't symptomatic anymore. They were no longer schizophrenic. They had had a schizophrenic episode. There was another 20% that was symptomatic but able to function okay. In other words, they could work, they could deal with their symptoms. And you have this sense of uh, schizophrenia outcome, sometimes referred to as a one-third, one-third, one-third. And it meant that the spectrum of outcomes. And if you really go into that, it means this. One-third, this is prior to the arrival of the drugs, would have an episode, a time of schizophrenia, and then it would pass. It wouldn't become permanent. And maybe they'd be, as one person said, have some odd, odd ideas, but they'd be okay. Then there'd be another third that would be out in the community and able to function okay, but maybe still symptomatic, hearing voices or whatever it may be, and then there was a third that was chronically ill. And the point of this is, is we have a memory of schizophrenia as a necessarily a diagnosis that leads to a deteriorating course. That's just not true from 1945 on, okay? So, that's the first data point. The next data point is, believe it or not, in, in the U.S., they did do a big study in 1956 and 1957 of over more than 1,000 first episode schizophrenia patients that just looked at discharge rates for those treated with medications and those treated without medications, without the new antipsychotics. The discharge rate was actually higher for those not treated with medication, and it ended up like something like 88% after 18 months. My point is, there's plenty of evidence before we get into the drug era of people recovering from a psychotic episode or what's called schizophrenia and being able to go back into the community and work, and we sort of lose that memory of that possibility. Okay, so we go forward, and then we'll get into the studies here in just a second. Well, why don't we start the studies? The first well-designed study was a nine-hospital study done in the 1960s by the NIMH, and it has four arms. Three, group are treated, three of the groups are treated with drug, the fourth with placebo. At the end of six weeks, the drug-treated patients are doing better, and this study is still cited today as providing evidence of the acute efficacy of the drugs, it's also this study where the drugs get renamed. Before this study, the drugs are known as major tranquilizers. But be after this study, the researchers say these drugs are not just tranquilizers, they're anti-schizophrenic drugs, they're anti-psychotic drugs. So it's this moment in 1963 where we reconceptualize the medications. However, if you look at that data, many of the placebo patients got better, then they're discharged, and at the end of one year, the researchers note something odd. There's a higher rehospitalization rate in the three drug-treated groups than in the placebo group at the end of one year. So at this very early moment of the outcomes literature, you see the vaguest hint of a paradox. Could drugs that are effective over the short term be increasing the chronicity over the long term? It's just the vaguest hint, okay? Next, we have a retrospective study done by Sanporn-Bachoven, 
at Boston Psychopathic Hospital. He's got data from a group of patients, first episode psychotic patients, treated in 1947 with psychosocial care, but no drugs, obviously. And now he's got a similar group of patients treated in 1967 with psychosocial care plus antipsychotics, okay? He follows them for five years. And what does he notice? Two things. One, there's actually a higher relapse rate in the modern group, the 67 group. But more, what's more impar important is the 67 group now is much more socially dependent. They're much more likely to be on welfare and not working. So if you read this study, Sanborn Bakoven says this. He says it's a surprise. But if we're interested in long-term clinical function, uh, long-term functioning and long-term social functioning, we may need to rethink the use of these drugs. That's Sanborn Bakoven. Because of this, in the 1970s, the NIMH actually revisited the idea of the use of antipsychotics. And they ran three studies with a longer term outcome. One was one year, one was two years, one was three years, to see are they really helping people over the long term and in the aggregate. The first study was done by um, Maurice Rappaport at the University of California, San Francisco. It was designed like this. People come into the hospital. They're either randomized to drug or they're randomized to nothing. Okay, it's not even placebo. They're just in the hospital, then they're discharged, and then they're followed for three years. Here's his findings. Of the 41 randomized to nothing, 24 never needed to go on drug, and it was that 24, that group that was able to recover from their psychotic episode without going on antipsychotic that had by far the best outcomes at the end of three years, both in terms of social functioning and relapse rates. And we're gonna see this later on. Only 7% of that group relapsed in three years, okay? In other words, if they could get back to stability without being on the medication, you saw a lot of stability. That was one finding. The second finding was, was the highest rehospitalization rate actually was in the medication compliant group. They had a 73% rehospitalization rate. This was group placed on drugs immediately and then stayed on drugs through the three years. Um, and then if you just look at social functioning, again, it was that 24 of 41 that had the best functioning. So you really have two findings. If we delay initial use, there'll be a subset of patients that can get better without going on the drugs, and that initial delay leads to better overall outcomes. So what has Rappaport said? At the very least, if we're interested in long-term functional outcomes, working, that sort of thing, there's at very least a subset of patients that would do better if we didn't immediately medicate, okay? That's what they found. The second such study of this type was done by Lauren Mosher. He was head of schizophrenia studies at the time. He ran a study called the Soteria Project. People come into the hospital. They're either randomized, uh, it's quasi-randomized, straight to drug, hospital treatment, or they're taken to a home, a Victorian-type home, which is uh, staffed by people that, frankly, the, the job description is this. You can be with people in a crazy state and not get freaked out. That basically was the job description. The house was led by a very extraordinary man for 10 years. It was led by Voice Hendricks. Voice Hendricks is the cousin of Jimi Hendrix. Extraordinary man, if you ever meet him. Big man, great musician, by the way. But he also has this ability, when you're in Voice's presence, he somehow signals to you that you're really a special person. He's really good about this. Just to some sense that the way you're with, you're going like, I'm pretty cool. And the point is, with this house, they had very little problems with violence, that sort of thing. And the whole idea was to be with people, do yoga, cook together, that sort of thing. And the use of drugs went like this. They did not immediately put people on antipsychotics but they did use benzodiazepines to help restore sleep-wake cycles. They believed restoring sleep was very important. And if after three or four weeks someone was not doing better, they would put them on an antipsychotic, okay? So it's a delayed use model. What are the findings? They eventually ran two soteria houses. One finding, psychotic symptoms abated just as quickly in the soteria patients as those treated conventionally with drugs.
Two, at the end of two years, they had better overall outcomes, lower psychopathology, more likely to be working, that sort of thing. And three, um, uh, here was the drug use. Roughly 40% never went on antipsychotic medication, roughly 40% used them temporarily, and 20% um, needed to be on the drugs permanently, chronically. So it's a selective use model that they basically saw. And you could, the conclusion was this, by Lauren Mosher and John Bola. If we're interested in long-term clinical improvement, we maybe need to rethink use of these drugs. Now I'll tell you, uh, just as just an anecdote, anecdote, no power of statistics or anything like this. But I, about three, four months ago, I was given a talk in Vermont. And this guy comes up afterwards, you know, he's working, he's been working, family, he says, hey, I was a Soteria patient. I had never met a Soteria patient. They sort of disappeared. He was one of the people who went there, stayed about three, four months, his psycho and he was so psychotic, he was taken to the emergency room, uh, you know, by police, <laughs> okay? And he had basically been psychotic, apparently, like, for a month. This was not, like, a minor thing. But for him, it was be turned into something of a lifesaver. So that was the second study. The third study was done by William Carpenter. He's still a well-known researcher in schizophrenia research in the United States. It was designed like this. It's done in-house at the uh, NIMH hospital. It has 49 patients. The idea is to show that psychotherapy is helpful. Everybody's going to get psychotherapy. 27, however, are not going to get drugs. 22 are going to get drugs, both get psychotherapy. And what do they find? Psychotherapy helps both groups. But the unmedicated group actually has a lower relapse rate at the end of one year and actually and has better social functioning as well. And then William Carpenter raises a really profound question. And this is late 1970s. Just read it. Think about the research he's trying to make sense of here. He's saying the drugs are effective over the short term. Once on, well, if you come off, you have a high relapse rate. Yet in all three studies, a higher relapse rate was associated with the usual standard of care. So he's trying to make sense of this paradox. And now he's worried that the drugs are causing a biological change that makes people more vulnerable to psychosis. Now you see why this is so profound? All drugs have risks and benefits, right? He's, so let's say risks are over here. He's worried about the benefit side of the equation. He's worried that these drugs that are meant to diminish psychosis, could they be increasing the risk of becoming psychotic long term? Okay? And maybe we'll pause. Just one last point here. When we talk about how an intervention shapes long-term outcomes, it doesn't mean that nobody does well on that intervention. It means like you have to know sort of like what the, the natural capacity is and are you in, to recover, say, and are you improving that or are you lessening that? And so, for example, the Hippocratic Oath. What's the Hippocratic Oath? Do no harm, right? Now, normally we, we, we take that to mean don't make your patients worse. But it's actually, I think, much more uh, complicated than that. What Hippocrates is saying is there's often a natural capacity in nature to recover from an illness. And your intervention has to beat that natural capacity to recover. So for example, imagine there's some illness and you do an intervention and it cures 50% of people and the other 50% stay the same. No one gets worse from the moment they come into your office. 50% cure, 50% stay the same. Have you met your Hippocratic Oath? No one got worse. What do you think? Who thinks they met the Hippocratic Oath? Okay, I think most people would think yes. And the answer is, you don't know. Because what happens if in nature, the natural recovery rate is 70% and only 30% stay the same? your intervention has actually lowered the recovery rate from 70% to 50%. So as we go forward with this question about how antipsychotics and how antidepressants shape long-term outcomes, it does not mean that everybody is getting worse or anything like that.
It just means compared to natural recovery rates, what are we doing? Are we improving the recovery rates or are we lessening the recovery rates? That sort of thing. Okay, so we'll go on after this, but this is the question now that's going to hover over the next 40 years. Okay, thanks.